My name is Tim Miller, and uh, as has been mentioned, I live in the Rockford, Illinois area, which is about 90 miles northwest of Chicago. I work for the North Park Church of Christ as their associate minister, and I've been doing that for about five years now. <clears throat> I've been married for 12 years to my wonderful wife, Kathy, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight, and uh, we have three children. Noah, my son, is 10. He's the oldest. Rebecca is nine. She's second, and Mary is a very, very precocious six. We have a fourth on the way. Uh, that's the primary reason my wife couldn't be here. Uh, she's due in June, June 12th. Uh, another little girl, and her name is Lydia. Uh, now my daughter Mary said, now mom, what happens if Lydia comes out and she's a boy? I said, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, so she's, she's been asking all kinds of questions. Where's, how does the baby come out? And you know, so mom's handling all those. Uh, as, as was mentioned, um, we came to live here uh, in the summer or fall of 1980, but actually we came, the first time I came here was in the summer of 1977. And in the summer of 1977, we came and, and mom and dad served as the house parents for unit three for the summer. And so that was my first introduction and experience. And I still remember some of the young men who were here, and uh, it's, it's the funny the things I remember. I remember certain songs that were popular on the radio and things like that. And then we came back in, in 1980 and stayed here for two years. And I'm, very, I'm profoundly grateful for the time that we spent here living on campus and the relationships, uh, and as Dad mentioned, really molded my life. Um, I have a family legacy of working with children. And, and prior to being at North Park, I really spent the last 20 years working with teens and young people through Christian camping and teaching at churches and, and serving as a deacon and, and doing some other things. And going back to even before I was born, this legacy was established. The first five years of my life, I lived on a Christian campground um, in Searcy, Arkansas. So I've always been around young people. And I think that that's a wonderful legacy to have. I think it's uh, one of the, the, the tenets of scripture to care for our young people. I really love the idea of this banquet. Uh, when, when Mr. Crowder told me about it, I thought, what a, what a neat idea. So much of our culture is focused on performance. Uh, what have you done? What was your test score? Uh, how fast did you run? How high did you jump? How much did you make? Everything is determined by performance. And I don't think that that's the kind of God that we serve. I don't believe that God is a performance-oriented God. There are not quotas that He sets for us to meet in order to please Him. The Lord judges the heart. He wants to know what our motivation is. And the idea of focusing on our strengths, and I enjoyed seeing the, the character qualities next to the young people's names as they were introduced, is such, I think, a, a much more healthy approach to praising one another. And, and, and encouraging us to be who we need to be as Christian people. With that in mind, the kind of family I want to talk about is the one that I, I really benefited from uh, when I woke up from my accident. Uh, when I went to the hospital, <clears throat> I was there for two or three days, and the last thing I remember is not being able to breathe very well. And then I blacked out, and I woke up two weeks later. Uh, it was a very strange experience. Uh, you know, I woke up and I didn't know where I was or why I was there or why all these tubes were in me or anything else. And so for two weeks, I was just oblivious to anything. And I was comforted to see that my physical family was around me, my mom and my dad, my wife, uh, my mother and father-in-law were there. Found out that my brother and sister had been there for more than a week at a time. And that gave me great comfort. But it paled in comparison to the blessing of, of realizing what had been going on while I had been so near death. Uh, as I got a little strength and I was able to understand and, and actually be awake for longer periods of time, my wife began to read through these uh, care page postings that people had. And I realized that, that thousands of prayers had been offered on my behalf. And I will tell you, it's a truly a humbling experience to have that happen. 
uh, it was, I was talking to Sheila earlier. She pointed out, and this is true, it's, very, it's not often that somebody gets to see how people would respond when they die. And I got to see that. Now, that sounds strange, but that was an unbelievable blessing to me. And, and I was overwhelmed. And the family that I'm talking about is our spiritual family. There were people literally from the East Coast to the West Coast, from, from Maine to California, from Texas to Illinois and Michigan, praying on my behalf. And those people I had connection through because of Jesus, because of my spiritual family. We are all going to have conflicts and problems in our immediate family. And you know what? We're going to have conflicts in our spiritual family as well. But to be connected and understand that we have a connection that's so much bigger than ourselves gives me tremendous comfort. And as I think about the idea of loving God and loving others, there's, there's few things that give me greater strength or encouragement than to be connected to that kind of group. That I can receive love from so many different people and places. And that I in turn can be used by God hopefully to pour out that love on others as well. And as I thought about success, I could not help but think about the Beatitudes. You know, Jesus paints a picture in Matthew chapter 5. And he, and he gives us kind of stepping stones or a way to achieve, I think, one, that relationship with God. And then two, how best to have a relationship with one another. In the first three Beatitudes, he talks about ideas that allow us to draw near to God, being poor in spirit, mourning, and being meek. Being poor in spirit, the idea of of seeing where you are in relationship to God, understanding that there is a chasm between you. That, That chasm, that distance, that separation is there because of the sin in your life, the sin of mankind. And that that the reality of that produces grief. We hate being separated. I mean Surely we can all relate to the idea of being separated from those we love. I know as I sat in a hospital for what seemed like an eternity, I longed just to see my children. I was in Michigan. It wasn't that bad. I felt like I was in prison. It has nothing to do with Michigan. But I was just felt so far from home. I was in the hospital for a month, and I thought, how do people do it? I can't imagine this. And I agonized over that. And... God wants us to understand that that, is the, that that relationship between us is even more significant. And that distance is there because of the nature of sin. And so we grieve over that. Bless those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. And the natural spiritual reaction to that recognition and that grief is to submit yourself and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. And that's what meekness is about. And when we've emptied ourselves of ourselves then God says, I'm going to fill you back up with righteousness. That's an integrity idea. Doing what is right because it is right. Trusting that God is the author of what is right. And once we have been filled with that righteousness, we are now ready to turn to those around us and be God's conduit, to be his beacon of love, to be merciful to those who need to be mercy, to see God in everything because we have purity of heart, to be peacemakers when we speak, and when we react and respond to situations. And in doing so, we promote His kingdom. True success, I think, ultimately is measured not by money. It's not measured by accomplishment or achievement. It is measured by peace. What people may know or may not know, but what is true, is that everyone longs to be at peace. We seek after the things we seek after, wanting to be at peace. Because in peace there is joy. And the only source of that peace is from God. I loved hearing some of the goals and ambition of the kids as they came in. Especially a young man who wants to go to Notre Dame. Big Notre Dame fan. And it's good to have those things. God talks about a man makes the plans in his heart. And it's good to have plans. It's good to have goals and ambitions. But it says that the Lord directs his paths. And to be at peace with the idea of, Lord, I want to do this, but what you want is more important than what I want, and I'm open. That is how we measure success.